nine. Malik screamed again. He screamed even though no one else could hear him. Not in the sanctum of his master. He screamed for a release from the agony, even though he knew none would come until the Primus chose, assuming that ever happened. It was within the master's power to see it that Malik's pain became eternal. That fear fueled the high priest's screams anew. Then, without warning, the pain ceased. With a gasp, Malik tumbled to the stone floor. The solidity of the floor amazed him, for he could have sworn that it had been floating in a sea of needles and flame. I could have sent a first year novice in your place and achieved just this splendid results, came the Primus's voice. There was none of the gentle calm in it for which the elder cleric was known to his faithful. Malik, however, knew that chilling tone well. It had always been focused on others, though, not upon him. And those upon whom it had been focused on, without exception, never left this chamber again. I'm so disappointed in you, the Primus went on. I had such high hopes for you, my Malik. Such high hopes. Who has been my favorite for far longer than any other mortal? The question was not a rhetorical one. Malik knew. I have great one yes yes you have my Malik your life has lasted double that of any human and in that time you have witnessed the premature passing of several others you may recall now the high priest of the order of Memphis truly expected his end to come he looked up Determined to face his master at the last. The Primus gazed down at his servant from his grand chair. Silent so long that Malik began to shiver despite his attempt to seem confident, even in the face of death or worse. But when the master deliberated so, it was generally to devise something particularly horrific. The scholarly figure rose and with measured steps joined his failed minion. The Primus viewed Malik as if debating something for the first time since he had managed to cast himself back to the Grand Temple, the High Priest allowed himself a shadow of hope. Was he to be granted a rev revive? I have invested much in you, my Malik. The Primus's voice darkened further. Each syllable was venom. Each word doom. The high priest hung his head again, certain that the sword would yet come down after all. Instead, it was his master's hand reaching for his own. Trembling, Malik extended his. Primus guided him to his feet. I am his son, my Malik, and answer to him as you do to me. I will give you your life this once, for there is in my mind a question that even you 
could not understand one that might have been bearing on this creature called Old Diazen. I'm truly grateful, Master. I live only to serve you, I swear. Still holding Malak's hand in his own, Primus nodded. Yes, you do. And to remind you of that, I give you a lasting gift. The high priestess screamed anew as his trapped appendage flared as if on fire. To his shock and dismay, it then twisted and curled, transforming. Gone was the soft flesh and sinew. In this place, thing warped, dripping, green, thick scales, scored the limb well past the wrist. The fingers grew gnarled and flawed, the last two digits fusing together to become one. The agony continued long after the spell had finished. Primus would not let Malak drop to his knees. He made the cleric stand and face him, the master's gaze keeping the servant prisoner. My mark is upon you now, my Malak. My mark and that of my father. The Primus finally released his grip. Now and forever. Malak shook but refused to fall. Weaving back and forth, he kept his gaze down and gasped. Great, great is Lucian, all-powerful and all-knowing. And greater still is, is his father the glorious and benevolent. The human dared look up again. Mephisto! Lucian smiled. His perfect tooth suddenly ending sharper, more pointed. His aspect became shadowed, in a manner having nothing to do with light. Although it was but a glimpse of his true self. Even still, it was enough to make the high priest pale more than ever. Then, as quickly as he had changed, the Primus once again looked his kindly part. He reached out and put his hand on Malak's shoulder. The cleric managed not to flinch. You have learned your lesson well, my Malak. That is why you remain my favorite. For the moment. Now, come. We will better pursue this matter below, I believe. As you wish, great one. Clutching his twisted, throbbing hand, Malak fell into place next to the Primus. He said nothing more, not wanting to revive his master's anger toward him. He whose true name was Lucian, son of Mephisto, led Malak not to the doors of the sanctum, but to the wall behind his throne. As they approached, the Primus drew an arc in the air. A blazing crimson arc formed on the wall. It quickly lengthened, the ends reaching the stone floor before Malak could draw a second breath. As they did, their area within faded away, revealing a torchlit corridor that descended into the ground as it toward some ancient tomb. More sinister, the walls themselves were flanked by a row upon a row of stone-like guards whose fearsome armor did not in the least resemble that of the Peace Orders. As Lucian and the High Priest of Mephis entered the subterranean corridor, the Grim Guards cast their gaze towards them. Immediately the ranks came to attention. Within black hounds shaped to resemble the skulls of 
hornless rams, black pits, not eyes, stared out. The warrior's flesh was the color of gravestones, and their breastplates bore the emblem of their unholy calling. A bleeding skull transfixed upon twin swords entwined by serpents. Malik knew their kind well, indeed had chosen many for their rank. Unlike their master, it did not frighten him, for their lot was to be led by the high priests in the name of the Primus on that day, when the temple would fully control sanctuary, and all pretense could be dropped. Sanctuary. It was a name known only to a few, most of whom were not of mortal flesh. Malak had learned the truth about his world from his master, who was in a position to understand the reality better than most. After all, was he not the blood, if such a simplistic term could be used, of the Lord of Hatred, whom some would call a demon, and who was, with his brothers Baal and Diablo, master of the burning hells? The concepts of good and evil had long ago become unimportant to Malik save in their most scholarly senses. The high priest understood only power, and that which the Primus represented was the ultimate power in all creation. Had it not represented was the three who had come together to form the realm of sanctuary and people it with the products of their imagination. And had not They'd been tricked by one they thought an ally and cast out of sanctuary for centuries. Yet despite that treachery, they now had a foothold back in the world of their making and soon they would rip it free from one who had stolen it. That cursed figure believed that he now had a kingdom all his own. Its inhabitants his to play with as he chose, but he had underestimated the three, and, in Malik's august opinion, the son of one, Lucian, most of all. It had been Lucian who had, after, uh, after all this time, forced the betrayer to come out of his hiding. To make his presence known to them. That was the first step toward retaking Sanctuary and returning it to what had been intended to be. A place from which those few worthy, such as himself, would be raised up to help the three transform all existence into a reflection of their true glory. And for those like Malik, that meant more power than the entirety of the mage clans and petty nobles combined. What exactly the Primus sought of this old diocese in this regard, even the high priest did not fully understand. To Malik's mind, it was most likely that old diocese was to be the first of a new legion of warriors for the three. What other use could there be? Malik saw the potential, had felt the potential, and so believed he was correct. His will properly broken. The farmer would readily succumb to Lord Lucian's will. He then would become a perfect servant, obeying all commands, no matter how dreadful. Just like a Morlu, the cleric thought. As if to reinforce that last thought, the corridor finally came to an end. A shimmering veal of poison green that Malak knew well confronted the pair. Again, the son of Mephisto gestured. The veal faded to so much smoke and dissipated. And, with a sudden jarring clash of metal against metal, the lair of the Morlu lay revealed. This was the name that Lucian had given his ram mass soldiers, the Morlu. It was a word of power, 
Two syllables steeped in the magic of the Primus's sire. The more were more than just fanatical. They lived and breathed the desire of the Lord of Hatred. They did not sleep any more than they did not eat. All the Morlu did was fight. And as Malak and his master entered the vast, bowl-shaped chamber dug well beneath the Grand Temple, they came upon the Morlu, indeed doing just that. Illuminated by thick, scalding rivers of molten earth flowing randomly through the huge cavern, the scene was one out of a nightmare worthy of a demon. The tremendous sea of armored figures hacked and slashed and sliced and thrust away one another with utter abandon and absolute glee. Every warrior bled from scores of deep ravines across their bodies. Limbs lay strewn upon the ichor soaked rock floor. Corpses by the scores littered the vicinity for as far as the eye could see. Malak beheld the heads lulling far from torsos. The mouths, if the jaws were yet attached, still opened in their death screams. Many of the faces lacked an eye or two, a nose or an ear, and they looked not at all different from most of the living, who, though likewise maimed and disfigured, were so caught up in the battle that they paid their wounds no mind. Bits of other body parts floated or lay on the banks of the lava rivers, and each breath more were added by the zealous combatants. A quick study of the scene below revealed that there was neither rhyme nor reason to the struggle, no identifiable sides in the conflict. The Morlu did not have such. Every warrior fought for himself. Siding with his brethren only long enough to accomplish some goal, at which point they tended to turn upon one another. They cheerfully slew one another with the same titanic effort with which they would have out if any other outside foe. Only against such were they truly uh, united, for that was what their lord desired most of them. They were to be a plague that would strike down those who would not be converted, who very likely served the betrayer, be it willingly or as a dupe. Lucian glanced up at the ceiling, although Malik knew well that the mighty figure was not at all interested in the rock formations there. The Primus looked beyond the moral sight into a place that all the training in the world could not reveal to the High Priest or any other mere human. We have timed our visit well. The hour is nigh, my Malik, murmured the Primus with something approaching the fondness a proud father might have for his children. Let us pause and savor the beauty of it all as it refreshes itself. Turning his eyes back to the cataclysmic site below, Lord Lucian gestured toward the very center where the worst of the carnage had and was still taking place. In the midst of everything, a black gemstone Nearly as large as a man sat embedded in a triangular column of red streaked marble. Blood marble, it was named naturally. The stone was called by Malik's master, the Kiss of Mephisto. Although the cleric had, from past comments, reason to believe that it had once been named for another of whom Lord Lucian would not speak. Behold, my Malik. As if time itself ceased, every Morlu warrior abruptly froze where he was. Blaze pods halfway into guts. Severed heads halted in their tumble from the ruined necks. Utter silence 
reigned over the humongous lair. The kiss of Mephisto let out a burst of black light. Not darkness, but completely, utterly black light. And as the light rushed over both the fighting and the fallen, they twisted and turned as if their bodies had become fluid. Lost limbs flew up to reattach, gaping wounds sewed together, mangled corpses shivered with renewed animation. Malik felt a twinge of re-embrace concerning his own recent change and clutched his disfigured hand anew as he watched events unfold. The ranks of the Morlu reconstituted themselves. Even from the steaming red depths of the magma rivers, the warriors emerged, resurrected. Their armor momentarily glowed bright from the searing heat in which their corpses had bathed, then faded to the dour black. It was a miraculous sight, Malik. This raising of the dead and healing of the wounded, even though he knew that in some senses it was not what it appeared, the stone did not have the ability to bring life back to the mortal remains. Those mortal who had been slain either this day or previous were not, in fact, even human anymore. Rather, they were cadavers animated by Mephisto's foul majesty through the will of the sun Lucian. What existed within was a demonic essence that mimicked the life that had once existed. Every new Morlu warrior quickly joined the ranks of the animated. So harsh was the constant battling. But they thought this in honor, believing that their souls or somehow still part of all of this. But what truly happened to those souls, only the Lord of Hatred surely knew, or so Malak at least thought. Within moments, the field was again filled with restless fighters in their prime. Several growled at one another, or brandished swords, maces, axes, and the like at potential foes. The blood that had covered much of the area had faded into the rock. To all apparent purposes, it was as if the battle had never taken place. Deimos, Lord Lucian whispered. From far off in the cavern, from deep within the ranks, a particularly large and grotesque Morlu turned and peered up at the pair. He suddenly raised his massive sword and gave a girl cry, a salute to his master. Primus nodded, then raised one hand with all fingers spread wide. Demos nodded and began barging through the rows of heaving bodies. Without warning, he seized one by the collar and dragged him from his position. That Morlu followed behind Demos as the Primus chosen commander sought another. In this manner, five soon followed Demos up the edge toward where Lucian and Malak awaited them. <laughs> Demos croaked as he bent down on one knee. His voice was akin to that of every other Morlu who had been slain once. It was as if, despite its best effort, the dark essence within could not completely mask itself as human. Demos's voice w could not, never have passed for mortal. Behind the lean Morlu, the five others also knelt. Lucian touched Demos on top of the ram helm, giving his blessing. Demos then turned his head toward Malak. Yeah. 
Malik repeated his master's gesture. Rise, Damos, commanded Mephisto's son. When the lead Morlu had obeyed, the Primus said, You are at the High Priest's command. You will obey him in all things. Yes. There are prey of both life and death involved, Damos. You understand the difference. The helm figure nodded. Not knew Damos from past need. The helm only partially obscured a face that looked as if the kiss of Mephisto had failed to completely remake it. Not much remained of the nose, save two gaping holes. And Demos' lower jaw seemed to have belonged to another, even larger creature. Perhaps a bear. The pits that had once been eyes were misaligned. However, other than the fact that his eyes were no more, they almost looked very much as he had when first being initiated into the living ranks of New Morlu. He had been one particularly ugly human inside and out, and his dark soul, even then, had disproven the adage of not judging a book by its cover. Indeed, there was little difference now between the Morlu, Deimos, and the thing currently inhabiting its shell. The High Priest will mark the one to salvage, the others to slay, continued Lucian. Then, to Malik's surprise, the Demon Lord added, But you will also have to be on your guard for another. Another? Ordered the clerk, suddenly recalling some of what he had blathered to his lord in defense of his failure as the Primus had punished him. There came an edge to the Primus's voice that Malak had never noted in all the years that he had served the Great One. It almost sounded like... Uncertainty? But no. Human quickly decided that could not be. Lucian was never uncertain. Never. I have sensed, the son of Mephisto said, after an equally unsettling silence, that all is not as it appears on the surface. There is some intrusion, some other. He trailed off, suddenly caught up in thought. The moral was stirred, uneasy, and Malik grew more perturbed. This was not how the master acted. He never paused so, never hesitated. What was happening? Who was this other? Malik again recalled his own suspicions during the debacle against the farmer. He had been overwhelmed by the incredible power wielded by the simplistic old Dyson, power combined with skill that the fool should have not had. The high priest had wondered then if there was something else going on behind the scenes that things were not as they had appeared. And now, and now Malik suspected that Lord Lucian thought the same. Lord Lucian, it seemed, believed his tale. Mephisto's son shook his head, his expression darkening monstrosity. No, it could never be. The expression passed away, leaving in its place the look of utter assurance to which Malik was more used. You will know it. The Primus went on suddenly and calmly to both the Clerk and Demos. This time, you will know it. 
it must be obliterated. The farmer, this old diet, an old diamond, must be preserved. But it and all else around him shall be no more. Is that understood? The lead Morlu bowed his head in acknowledgement. Malik nodded, his human hand still clutching the transformed one. Lucian noted his action, smiling benevolently. He said to the human, It is a gift I give you, my Malik. You will see. You will see. The pronouncement encouraged the high priest. Malik eyed the macabre appendage anew. His master did nothing without thought. An actual gift, after all? He could flex the digits as easily as he could the old ones, and in some cases, in manners not previously possible. The pain had finally begun to subside, too. Curiously, the clerk also felt stronger than he had. Steepling his fingers, the son of Mephisto concluded, Now it is time to seek anew the one called Oldiacin. I will, in this brook, no failure. That understood? Again, there was mute acknowledgement from both Malak and Demos. Then, that is all. You will depart immediately. The chosen Morlu gathered behind Malak, who bowed to the master. Eagerness had replaced fear in the heart of the cleric. He silently swore that he would bring old Dyson old Dion to Lord Lucian even if it meant beating the farmer until there remained just enough spark of life for the Primus to use. As he led Damos and the other five away, Malak also thought about his other intrusion of which his master had spoken. Despite whatever power it wielded, Lord Lucian wanted nothing of it. He wanted it destroyed, not preserved. It very much felt to the High Priest as if his master did know what or who it was. Malak was not the type to betray his master. No such fool was he. However, it would certainly do no harm to find out just what this other thing was. Then, once his curiosity was satisfied, he could let the Morlu destroy it. All that mattered was the fool of a farmer. Lucian did not watch Malik depart. He knew that he could trust the cleric to obey this time. The Moral had no other choice. The legions of Morlu continued to shaft at the bit, but Lucian let them wait. He had not told his servants all, not given them true indication of his thoughts. It cannot be, he argued with himself. It cannot be. Her. She. Cannot be here. And that made him think of other. Of the one with whom he played this game of control of the minds and souls of mortals. The one was as little like them as he was. Could it be that his foe had some part in this? Was this all a ploy? To put Lucian and his father off balance? It certainly made more sense than the possibility that she was here. 
he would not sell his father just yet, as Malik rightly feared punishment by the Primus. So too did Lucian fear the wrath of his sire. His own monstrous nature paled in comparison to that of the Lord of Hatred. Now, or now, Mephisto would not be told. But if it was her, then sooner or later Lucian would have to confront his father. I must find out more. What he had not told Malik was that live or die when next he confronted the farmer, the clerk would reveal to Lucian the truth about this second force using the human to shield it from his presence. Malik was bound by his new hand to his master more than he knew. There were abilities to the hand that could destroy even her at the cost of his human vessel, of course. Lucian found Malik particularly useful, but his loss would mean little if it meant securing sanctuary, especially from her. Trying to ease his mind, the Primus nodded at the waiting warriors below. With a collected cry, the Morlu win at each other again. Metal rang out against metal. A hundred warriors were slaughtered in the first breath. Blood splattered the floor of the vast chamber, and the cries of the wounded echoed. The last being music to the ears of their master. Yet despite revealing in the endless carnage created by his eager servants, Lucian's thoughts continually rebelled by returning to their previous subject. It could not be her. It could never be her. She was gone, either banished forever or dead. It was not within even her power to overcome either. He knew her well enough, did he not? Had he not once been as close to her as nearly any other? Only two had possibly known her better than Lucian, and one of those was his father. The other was his adversary, who had been the reason for her downfall, which brought the prominence again the question that Lucian would have liked to know the answer to. If this is not some plan of his, does he sense her possible return too?